Behold how good and how pleasant it is for people to dwell together in peace. This is the translation of the Hebrew words of our opening song this morning, Hinematov. If you'll rise in body and spirit, I'll tell you just a little bit more about this piece. It has got two fast parts and two slow parts, but like all great songs, sing whatever you want. <laughs> I will do my best to follow the boss and give you the classic marching band hand signals. If you see this one, it means do what you're doing one more time. And if you see this one, it means we're going on to the next thing. So if you have any anxiety about listening and singing, uh, you can watch me and you can always listen. We'll repeat each section multiple times so that you can get the hang of it and meditate on how beautiful it is to choose to be together over and over again.
What a beautiful start to a service that is going to focus on a Jewish heritage and particularly Sukkot. So welcome to the Boulder Valley Unitarian Universalist Fellowship this morning. I'm Reverend Lydia Ferrante Roseberry. I use she, her pronouns. I'm joined today by service associate Larry Lavender. Rabbi Sarah Gershuni will be joining us via Zoom during the service and live following the service in the sukkah that has been built out in the playground. No, out in the, that way. That way. <laughs> outside of the fellowship hall. <laughs> and so everyone is going to be invited to have coffee hour outside on this glorious day. And Rabbi uh, uh, Sarah will be sharing prayers and blessings uh, during that service. Today, during that time, today's music is provided by Tad and Emily Corius. Yes, thank you. Debbie Larson, who was on drums on percussion just now, and Linda Salve. So welcome, Linda. And today's tech team is Deborah Dixon Mench and Kathy Partridge. Please join me in the spirit of radical hospitality as I say our welcome words today. You are all welcome here today in all the beauty of languages, cultures, skin tones, shapes and sizes, gifts and challenges that come together in your uniqueness, you are welcome here. In all the ways you experience and express gender, you are welcome here. In the beauty that is who you love and how you love, you are welcome here. In all the ways you make your living and all the places you are from, you are welcome to bring those here with you including all the traditions that inform your spiritual life. And no matter how long you are away, nor how soon you will return, you are welcome here. Whether you come today with laughter in your heart or with tears, you are welcome here among us. You are invited to join us with a curious mind, a loving heart, and a, willing, and, and a willing spirit. We welcome you today. Here at the fellowship, we commit ourselves to being a center for spiritual exploration and justice making, and to anti-racism and anti-oppression work within and beyond the walls of our congregations, and particularly in our own hearts as we seek to dismantle um, prejudice in all of its forms. Today's celebration of Sukkot is in line with our School of the Spirit religious education monthly theme on Judaism. Each month this year, our children and youth will be learning about how other faiths inform our Unitarian Universalist tradition. And over the course of the year, we'll be bringing those traditions here into the sanctuary and creating multi-generational events following the service. So there'll be lots of fun ways to interact and to be learning together this year. If you're new here, we are really glad you found us, whether you're here in person or on Zoom. Hello, Zoomies. And um, we hope that all of you can experience the warmth and the love of this congregation. Please come back a few times to really get to know us. And we also have many opportunities during the week for connection, spiritual connection, social connection, justice-related activities. If you're here in the room, you can go to the welcome table to learn about those activities. And those on Zoom will find it uh, going into the chat now. There'll be some links for you. Everyone on Zoom is welcome to stay for casual conversation following the service or attend our inquirer series, which will start about 15 minutes following the end of the service. For those of you who are here in the room, it will be happening in the sanctuary. And today's inquirer session is a question and answer session with me. So chat with the minister. If you're joining us on Zoom, please feel free to greet each other in the Zoom chat. And especially if you're a newcomer, let us know, because we love to know who is among us. 
Those of you in the sanctuary, take a moment to say hello to someone near you, and especially maybe someone you don't know so well. I'm going to invite us now to recenter ourselves. Let us recenter ourselves with our chalice lighting this morning. Oh, this is such beautiful energy. You know, Sukkot is a, it's a celebration, so I'm really enjoying the celebratory energy. If you have a chalice at home, those of you on Zoom, you can feel free to light it while we light the fellowship chalice. And all of us, please say the words together for our chalice lighting. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, the light of truth, and the energy of action. And now I'm going to sing our bowl again, inviting it to draw you deeper into the present moment and into the company of this beloved community. Follow the sound of the bowl as far as you can hear it, and then we will stay for a moment or two or three of silence together. Good morning, and welcome to our service, exploring the Jewish festival of Sukkot. It's coat, like wrapping it around you. I, I did some research on the festival, thinking I would write a short poem to capture the spirit of Sukkot. But you and I both got lucky, and I found a perfectly genuine poem <laughs> written by the Velveteen Rabbi. <laughs> Check it out, it's online. I'm not making this up. Who would make that up? Anyway also known as Rabbi Rachel Berenblatt, uh, who ministers to a Western Massachusetts community. She wrote the poem in October of 2009 while she was pregnant and near term with her firstborn child. In the poem, she speaks to her unborn child about change. I liked her introduction to the poem almost as much as the poem itself. So from here on out uh, to the end are the thoughts and words 
of the Velveteen Rabbi, lightly edited for tense and context. Friday at sundown, the festival of Sukkot began. During the subs subsequent week, celebrants dwell, or at least hang out and dine, in little outdoor houses called sukkahs. A sukkah must be permeable to the elements. One should be able to see the full moon and stars through the loose branches of its roof. It is a celebration of the harvest in this hemisphere and a chance to remind ourselves that even the solid structures we build aren't as permanent as the fact of change. Nothing hammers home that truth for me as vividly as my swelling belly that squirms and kicks, and I've grown accustomed to feeling these inside me. The hand-me-down baby gear accumulating in the nursery. So this week, poem draws both on the Jewish holiday seasonal cycle and on the cycle of my embodied year and the changes in my life which are underway. The name of the poem is Permeable. Today, I'll finish our sukkah, stacking old wild flowers to hint at a roof, twining tinsel around the slats. All year, we imagine our houses are our houses, stable and comfortable, waterproof and familiar. But these seven days remind us that permanence is overrated. That our true home is under the stars. Change is always underway. Nine short weeks remain until you leave the home you probably think is forever and enter our world, airy and unpredictable, where we won't know what you need, even sometimes when you tell us. Your first big le leap of faith, ghetto, into nothing you've ever known into the fragile sukkah we've decorated just for you. To those who celebrate, I wish a hag shamaya. May your sukkot be joyful. To continue this theme of the cycles of nature and how they're reflected in our human beings, we'll join together in singing from the Teal Hymnal, number 1068, Rising Green. I'll invite you to rise in body or in spirit, whatever feels right to you at this moment. It's number 1068.
The Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker, one of my mentors, wrote, how we tell ourselves where we come from matters. How we tell ourselves where we come from matters. Within our tradition of Unitarian Universalism, we are known to look back at our New England roots and claim some of the nation's early founding fathers as devout Unitarians. People like Thomas Jefferson, who is known to have said, I trust that there is not a young man now living in the United States who will not die a Unitarian. I think he was a little off on his prediction there. The numbers of our denomination are hardly uh, um, huge, let's say. And his statement also has a piece of the hubris that sometimes we hear in Unitarian Universalism. Yeah, is there a little, did I hear an amen in there? Yes. Yeah, it's like that sense that somehow we got religion figured out. And the other people will come along at some point. My colleague, Reverend Fred Muir, points out in his fabulous uh, essay called From I Church to Beloved Community, he calls that our Unitarian Universalist exceptionalism. If we're carrying that story forward, if that's our only story of our history, how does that cause us to react and to live our faith? But if we look deeper and further back into our history, there is a different story to tell. A story that invites us into interreligious connections and exchange. A story that, in which Unitarians as anti-Trinitarians were central to inter-religious dialogue. In her book, Children of the Same God, Unitarianism in Kinship with Judaism and Islam, Reverend Dr. Susan Ritchie takes a deep dive into this early Unitarian history to share a narrative of Unitarians as a religious people who did not think of themselves as a higher form of intellectualized religion, but in fact, as deeply intertwined and respectful of diverse traditions. She posits that European Unitarianism was formed in large part to honor Christianity's close kinship with Judaism and also Islam that they were trying to, to create a corrective, this anti-Trinitarianism was trying to create a corrective to keep people together during the time when there was a lot of uh, religious animosity all around. It was a time when many Christians were persecuting both uh, Jews and Muslims. In light of today's Sukkot, celebration, I'm going to be focusing on Judaism this morning. And I want to share two different ways that Unitarians were intertwined with Jews in the 15th and 16th century Europe. In the late 1400s in Spain, with increasing waves of anti-Semitism crossing Europe, Spanish Jews who had previously thrived under a fairly generous tolerance were given the choice by Christians of either exile or conversion. The dramatic cultural and theological changes that resulted from, a far, from a, the large number of Jews who converted to Christianity to remain in their homeland, so lots of them were like, no, we're not leaving, we're just gonna stay and convert. It was unanticipated by those who sought to kind of insulate Spanish Catholicism from Jewish influence. So these new Christians included all kinds of people, some of them who were called by the derogatory term Moranos, who were practicing Judaism in secret while outwardly adopting Christian observances. 
Rooting out these Moranos was the first task of the Inquisition, and at least in the beginning, that was its reason for being the Inquisition. Other new Christians were called conversos, and they tried to negotiate for themselves an authentic Christian practice that was harmonious with their past in Judaism. And so they did that by trying not to engage in the more divisive and doc doctrinal sides of the Christianity that was being posited them. Some tried to define a Christian humanism with its endearing focus on everyday spirituality that was lived out in people's lives, with a focus on self-examination that we see in humanism today, and a focus on love, also deeply rooted in our humanist tradition. Other conversos wrestled more openly with Christian doctrines that were most difficult for persons of a Jewish tradition to adopt. The chief of the, the primary one of which, of course, was the doctrine of the Trinity. Susan Ritchie argues that this anti-Trinitarianism, which became our Unitarianism, was a way to purposefully resist theology that did not travel across other faiths very well. So in our roots, was this desire to actually keep varieties of religious traditions together and in dialogue with one another respectfully. Marcus Servetus, for those of you who might know a little bit about Unitarian history from this time, was a famous Unitarian who chased John Calvin all around Europe, <laughs> arguing his anti-Trinitarian cause. And he emerged out of this mid-century Spanish uh, tradition. He didn't have a family lineage that connected him to Judaism, but he was certainly intimately familiar with the most radical Jewish and this new Christian scholarship that was trying to, you know, open up Christianity a little bit more. And he knew a lot about Hebrew and Jewish biblical study. So that was, he, he, he had part of his, part of his life was in, in this little moment of tolerance. And he took that out and tried to kind of nudge John Calvin into opening up a little bit. But Calvin ultimately had him martyred for his anti-Trinitarian beliefs. Servetus preached and wrote in service of helping Christianity maintain some interreligious tolerance. That's a different story of our roots. The other stories about the, I'm, I'm, so for any of you who know Romanian, Hungarian language, I know I'm not gonna do this very well. The Sikhi Jews in now, the now historic village of Buza Dolphin in the Eastern part of historic Transylvania, which is now Romania. The sad ending to this little town, this little village, was that in 1989, the village came, came to be ruthlessly destroyed by the Romanian communist dictator, Ceausescu, closing a very special chapter in the history of Unitarian multi-religious engagement. Because for 400 years prior for that, this old little village was quite small but unusual in the quality and quantity of its religious diversity. People frequently visited each, their neighbors' places of worship, and the festivals of each tradition were celebrated by all. The village included congregations of Catholics, Reformed Christians, Unitarians, Jews, and of this particular group called the Sikhe, Sikhi Jews. Sikhi Jews were originally Unitarians who adopted Jewish practice as an extension of their liberal Protestant convictions, but who over many long years evolved to take on an exclusive Jewish identity. This makes this particular group of Jews a unique example of an entire community of people adopting Judaism 
without the historic or genealogical ties to the tradition. They may be the only community of Jews that we know that has ever done that. In this unique small village with long Unitarian roots, interreligious dialogue was deeply valued. What if we deeply understood our heritage today as a people not who are trying to turn everybody into us, but instead as a people who deeply valued this interreligious dialogue, this coming together of honoring one another's traditions, of capturing the breadth and the beauty of it, without any covert message of conversion? What if we were really committed to learning from each other in respectful ways? What if this part of our history is what we told one another again and again and again? How rich might our lives be? In this time of Christian nationalism, this history matters. Let me make clear that Christian nationalism, whose goal is to achieve a Christian theocracy in this nation in particular, is not the same as Christianity. There are so many beautiful, faithful Christian denominations and traditions engaged in honoring diverse beliefs and building beloved community. And I caution us to be remain clear about this because there is also a thread within Unitarian Universalism that tries to uh, uh, both deny our Christian past and that Unitarianism was a Christian tradition and also kind of uh, treat it as the lesser, a lesser tradition. I really want us to be clear and caution us not to fall into the trap of pushing away our allies in our work for justice, freedom, and inclusivity. As I was reading again about the Inquisition, <laughs> I was thinking about our times now where more and more Jewish synagogues, Muslim mosques, and even Unitarian Universalist congregations are being targeted by hate groups, bent on instilling fear and even violent acts to serve their oppressive agenda. What if those relationships that we held so dear in the 15th and 16th century we're tight now so that together we could be a united front that speaks to the love of diverse religious traditions, that understands each other's differences and brings them forth and celebrates with one another. Fred Muir writes, we Unitarian Universalists have arrived at a breakthrough moment where we must write a new narrative. We have an urgent need for telling, writing, and living the story of who we will be, who we are becoming, and I would add, and who we came from. We must speak and live the Unitarian Universalist story we want others to know. Learning about and living into this rich history of ours, a history of people who desperately tried to engage the Christian powers that be in inclusive interreligious community, that can help us create this new narrative. Let us be about that work together. <laughs>
Each week, we remind ourselves of the abundance of our lives. This community, by having half of our plate, giving half of our plate away to other organizations that share our values. Today's half plate collection will go to Colorado Statewide Parents Coalition, or CSPC. CSPC's mission is to build power and support a movement in marginalized communities of families and childcare providers to change systems, build leaders and train families and providers to be the strongest and best advocates for their children to succeed in school and beyond. El Paso engaged a la Latino Parents Advancing Student Outcomes was a Boulder County nonprofit with which the fellowship worked for many years, and it recently was incorporated into CSPC. The CSPC tutoring program coordinator is Jocelyn Moran, who is looking for new tutors. Any new tutors out there? <clears throat> Jocelyn will be with us uh, today for coffee hour and can answer any questions at that time. You can text your donation at the number on the screen. Uh, or if you are in the fellowship today, place a donation in the offering plate as it passes. Please give generously as you so often do. As our musical reflection begins, we invite you to reflect upon and write into the chat, if you are on Zoom, your answer to this question. Has your understanding of your heritage changed over time? And how has that impacted you? Thank you. 
for the work of the fellowship, bringing love, reason, compassion, and justice into our world, and the work of the Colorado Statewide Parent Coalition, teaching young people such a beautiful gift. We dedicate our efforts and our offerings. It is from this place of our shared roots and the genuine love of interreligious learning that I invite you to listen to the following reflection from my dear friend and colleague, Rabbi Sarah Gershuni, who will be offering us background and history of the Jewish celebration of Sukkot. Hi, thanks so much for this opportunity to come and teach you a little bit about the holiday of Sukkot, which began this past Friday night and will continue through the coming week. This is really one of the highlights of the Jewish calendar. It's one of the most joyful and inclusive uh, of all of the holidays. And um, I'm excited to teach you about some of its core practices as well as its history and meaning. For those of you who are a little bit familiar with the Jewish calendar, you'll know that we've just come out of the period known as the Days of Awe, Rosh Hashanah, the New Year, followed 10, ten days later by Yom Kippur, the uh, Day of Atonement, or some like to say Day of Attunement or at one -ment. Uh, You can actually see this whole period as something of a rite of passage. Anthropologists uh, tell us that all successful rites of passage tend to have three phases. Firstly, the, uh, or centrally, the ordeal itself, which the person has to undergo to pass from the old status into the new status. But for a rite of passage to be successful, it also classically has a period of preparation, of education and intention leading up to that central ordeal. And it also crucially has a period of celebration um, or homecoming afterwards where the person or people who've undergone the rite of transformation um, come back into the group and are celebrated um, in their new status. So seeing thus, we could actually kind of consider the whole of this month as being a rite of passage, which allows us to pass from one year into the next. Uh, Yom Kippur itself is that central ordeal, as you might know, it's a day uh, of fasting, 25 hours of no food and no water, which is classically spent praying and in supplication and confession throughout the day. It's prepared for uh, by some for a number of weeks of, of real introspection and fixing of one's ways, um, and certainly for the 10 days that lead up to it, beginning with Rosh Hashanah on the first of the lunar month, on the new moon, uh, this begins 10 days, what's called the 10, Aseret Yemei Teshuvah, the 10 days of returning, returning to one's higher self, to one's intentions, to the best of, uh, to the best of one's behavior. Um, and then, I mention all this because Sukkot, it seems to me, really is that holiday that comes after this ordeal, where we celebrate that we've made it to the other side and we're here in community uh, with one another. This uh, holiday begins on the 15th of the month, on the full moon of this same month. So Sukkot, which is also known as Sukkot, same word, different pronunciation, is in English sometimes called the Feast of Tabernacles from the Greek or the Feast of Booths. And a tabernacle or a booth is the best translation of the word Sukkah, the uh, originally something of a harvest lean-to, it was put up in the fields because this is a harvest holiday. This is the very end of the growing season where the uh, fruits and vegetables are gathered in. And we begin to turn our attention towards the rains, um, which we're hoping will fall amply in the coming months to re-fertilize the land. And I think one of the ideas of sitting in this space which is half indoors, half outdoors for a week, is to draw particular attention in our awareness of the changing of the seasons and of fragility of life and how dependent we are on the rains for all things to be able to grow and sustain us. 
The sukkah or tabernacle or booth is a sort of semi semi permeable abode. It's not meant to be permanent. In fact, the roof cannot be permanent or it doesn't uh, qualify as a sukkah. The roof also has to be see through. You have to be able to see the stars through it um, to keep that awareness that you're half outside. And this permeability also lends itself to uh, the inclusivity of a greater hospitality. Uh, where I grew up, it was very common to do sort of sukkah hopping, to go from one person's sukkah to the next. And uh, as with a block party, there's a way in which being half outdoors makes it that much easier to uh, connect with neighbors and people, people around and to, um, to come into one another's spaces and celebrate together. It also, I think, makes us uh, all the more aware that we're all in fact guests all the time in God's house that much as we may think we're in control, really, we're not. So um, there are a couple other ways in which this holiday is particularly um, inclusive and universalistic, which I thought I would share with you. One is that in ancient times, it was during this week that uh, offerings of animals were made um, on behalf of all of the nations of the world uh, by the Jews in the temple, in the great temple in Jerusalem. Um, we also have in our liturgy the idea of a great sukkah of peace enveloping the earth. This is a, um, a theme of this kind of inclusivity and um, the sheltering presence of the divine that the sukkah represents. Now, there's one other central practice beyond building and dwelling in a sukkah um, for seven days that this holiday teaches us about, and that is the practice of taking four species, four different uh, plant species grown in the land of Israel, and binding them into a bundle and shaking them in the six directions uh, and the seventh direction of the center within um, to, um, well, to indicate God's presence all around as one understanding there are more hopefully i'll get to actually show you and teach you uh, in about an hour while i will step off the screen and join you in person god willing um, but i'll just introduce these four species now the first is the unopened branch of a date palm the next is the fruit of a citron tree as you can see it's a bit like a lemon not exactly The next are these branches, the myrtle tree. And last but not least, the branches of willow. Now, all of, these, um, all of these different species have a particular connection to water. They're all very dependent, everything is, but these are, have particular and unique um, relationships with water and um, are part of our prayers for rain for the season to come. They also each come from a different area of the land of Israel, from the desert, the palm, from the, um, from the river corridors, the, the Jordan River Valley, the willows, the lowlands, the myrtles, and the highlands, highland uh, orchards are where the citron is grown. And bringing them together is a way to represent the whole land holistically. However, not just representing the whole land, the rabbis take these four species as representative of four different archetypal uh, members of the community, all of which have an important place and come together because the bundle needs all four elements in order to be kosher and complete. And the way that they, um, the way they learn this out is that one of these um, one of these species has a smell and a taste one has only smell one has only taste and one has neither um i'm not sure i said that right but you get the point um the citron has both smell and taste and this is taken as representative of the person who has both torah learning they're both learned and they do good deeds the myrtle smells wonderful, 
but has no taste. And this is like the person who's just learned uh, but doesn't have a particular practical impact on society. The palm has a fruit, the dates grow from this. And this is the person who has good deeds, but no particular learning. And then the willows is the person who has neither smell nor taste, uh, neither particular learning nor particular good deeds. However, as I mentioned, the idea is that all of these elements are necessary to make the wholeness of community. All of these are valid and important uh, parts of not just uh, the ritual, but how we come together and live together, God willing, in our sukkah of peace, our place of rest and repose within the sheltering presence of the divine. So I'll be giving a little lesson in how to um, bench lulav, how to uh, lift and wave these four species uh, in just about an hour, I think. So I'll look forward That's to seeing that. you there and then. And I thank you again for this opportunity. And I'll teach you the greeting as well. In Hebrew, we say Chag Sameach, which means a happy holiday. And in Yiddish, slightly easier to pronounce, we say Gudjontiv. So let's try that. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. Try it. And Gudjontiv. Gudjontiv. And it's fine if someone says one to you, you can reply with the other. That's, that's uh, people will think you're very legit. So I look forward to seeing you and greeting you in about an hour. Many blessings, or maybe a little less than an hour. I'll see you soon. Chag Sameach. Thank you so much. That was a really beautiful uh, way to have us enter into our time of community sharing, our time of joys and concerns. If you're on Zoom and you have a joy or a concern you'd like to share, please uh, type it into the chat window, sending it to everyone, and then let us know briefly what is in your heart today. And then following uh, the joys and concerns that we share here live, I will read the ones from the chat, and Larry will place a stone in our sacred waters on your behalf. If you're in the sanctuary today, you can come up front um, sharing your joy and concern, holding the microphone straight in front of you so everybody can hear you well. And then you can add a stone to our waters. Or you can always come forward and just add a stone in silence. And wherever you are, please tell us your name and where you live. That helps us build the bonds of connection here in the, in the congregation. And would you add one last stone for all of those joys and concerns that remain in the silent sanctuary of our hearts, knowing that even in our silence, we are bound together in the web of life. Beloved, as we come together to celebrate Sukkot, the end of this Jewish um, initiation period, we come with our own mix of joys and celebrations and concerns. We come with our own griefs, our own losses, some too tender to share. May this gathering in community be a balm for those of you whose souls are weary. Whether you are weary from something in your own life, from people you love who are hurting or your own ailments, or whether the weight of the world is weighing down on you particularly heavy today. Allow this community to nurture you. And for those of you who are coming with celebration in your hearts, let that come forth as well. For the world is made up constantly of challenge and beauty and joy. And to deny ourselves the joy of celebrating is to deny ourselves part of the richness of life. Joy can be a subversive act 
in hard times. Let us remember that as a community, we come together with all of it, all the time. And let us remember to celebrate what needs to be celebrated to bring love and life into our world, especially in tender times. May this be our promise and our prayer. Blessed be. So coffee and, and fellowship time will be both in the fellowship hall and outside. There will be harvest goodies, crafts, and a time to celebrate in the sukkah, and Rabbi Sarah will be here to share in these festivities with us. Uh, it, you, also, if you want to, you can stay in here for the inquirer session, chat with the minister, and that is available on Zoom as well. Next Sunday, October 8th, is the campus tour for our inquirers session. And Amy Austin has something she wanted to announce for us. One of the things about our technology-oriented world is that we have lost so many opportunities to have live music as we just did here. Uh, and I know lately I've been saying yes to some opportunities and being reminded that live music is just something so completely different than what you would see on television or, or on YouTube. So Tad and I have some things to invite you to. First of all, we want to encourage you to come this Friday. Tad and I have 75 friends who are all going to gather on this stage as Colorado repertory singers. And honestly, of uh, the concerts that I've sung so far with this group, this one has just music that has deeply touched me, and I know that you'll enjoy it. We've already sold 120 tickets, so make sure you grab the rest of those and come see us. Um, there's gonna be papers out there that have a Q code for you to scan. You can get tickets. On Thursday of next week, October 5th, which happens to be my husband's birthday, um, there is um, Melanie Damore, who is um, a, a, a teacher of oral tradition and community singing, and I know some of you have participated in her workshops before. That's going to be at the UU Church of Boulder. And then on Friday, October 20th, and I'm telling you what, if you miss the John Gunther concert, you're going to be sorry for the rest of your lives because it was so fabulous. But there's another fantastic opportunity, the Juniper um, Wind Quintet, which are grad students who are at CU. Uh, they are excellent, and that's going to be on Friday. Uh, yes, Friday? Yeah, Friday, October 20th. So I'm looking forward to seeing you at all of those, except the one on my husband's birthday. <laughs> Now we will extinguish our chalice, so please say with me our, our words. We extinguish this chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, nor the energy of action. These we carry in our hearts until we meet again. I invite you to rise in body or spirit, join hands or link arms with someone else or give yourself a nice hug if you'd prefer. And we'll come together for the benediction. We, ooh. Beloveds, let us truly know our heritage. And from that place, where we can see the love shining through from our ancestors, let us bring love forth. Blessed be, amen. Wonderful.